Welcome back. Hello. We have a wonderful scripture reading for you from Matthew 27, the New King James Version. We're going to be reading the entire thing. Uh, so if you'd like to open up your Bibles, you can do so and read along with us. When morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they put, they bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. He then threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed. And he went and hanged himself. But the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful to put them in the treasury, because they are pieces, they are the price of blood. And they consulted together and bought them with the potter's field to bury strangers in. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took the pieces of silver, the value of him who was priced, whom the children of Israel priced, and gave them to the potters, for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And when he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him, not one word, and so that the governor marveled greatly. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing the multitude, one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Here we go. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who was called Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said to him, let him be crucified. Then the governor said, why, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more saying, let him be crucified. And when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, his blood be on us and on our children. Then he release Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him saying, hail king of Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. Now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots. 
that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and they put up over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him come now. Come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Now, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on the reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit. Hopefully I don't voice crack. I'm sorry if I do. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee ministering to him were there looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Now when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who him himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it into, in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there, and the other meetings, Mary sitting opposite of the tomb. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, remember when he was still alive how... How that the deceiver said, after three days, I will rise. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest the disciples come by night and steal him away. And say to the people, he has risen from the dead, so the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go your way, make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard.
Thank you, team, for reading Matthew chapter 27. And guess what? I'm going to teach the whole thing. I'm excited about it, and it's very powerful, but I'll just go a little longer than they did. But I won't go too long. There's so much there, and I wanted all the verses read because every detail leading up to Jesus' death is so vital and very important. I want to give you two announcements before I start this message. The first is this Thursday, we're very blessed to have the Love Movement luncheon here in our sanctuary. We're going to be putting up tables and chairs, and the pastors of the valley and ministry leaders are going to be here, and we're going to bless them with the Thanksgiving lunch, and we're very excited about that. And we also have Ray Johnston coming here from Bayside. He's also the founder of the Thrive Conference, and he's going to be bringing a word of encouragement to the ministers of the valley. So what I need from you is two things. Pray. Pray that God touch their lives. Secondly, if anybody wants to volunteer to help with the lunch, we've got the food preparation already in place, but we could use some service and greeters and some wonderful people who could let the community know that Church 212 is a place of love and that we love the churches of the Coachella Valley. So please let me know. I would have you let Stephanie know, but she doesn't answer her text from me and from other people I heard this morning. So, and she's a busy lady, and the wonderful thing, she's busy doing what I tell her to do. <laughs> now, see, you are laughing because you know that's a joke. The second thing is, and this is very important, I need you to put it on your calendar. And husbands, you need to turn to your wife and say, Alice, you need to listen to what he's about to say. Uh, we're going to have a very significant service on December the 5th, Sunday morning. And actually, we're going to have a laying on a hand service for Pastor Daniel. He told us not to call him pastor, but I've been calling him pastor. Pastor Daniel, and to really transfer the anointing of God to help lead this church in January. But, by the way, me and Steph are not leaving, and we're very excited about being a part of the team. So, I'm not going to give you all the details, but we got some very special people coming who's going to be here, some people from out of town that's going to be here to say, we want to, we want to bless uh, what's going on at Church 212. And that should be no surprise to you because he's been running the church over a year. And uh, thank you, Daniel, for all the faithful service that you've done. And thank you for that song, by the way. That was so beautiful today and so apropos. Last week, we taught an encounter with Jesus. And I hope you had one and are having one. And we told the stories of four people with different experiences and various responses. I hope that you are like the woman with the alabaster box. You've bowed your knee to Jesus and you've surrendered it all to him and you've given your most precious gift, your life. That's what it's all about. Today I want to talk to you about Jesus' painful encounter with pain-filled people. There's actually 14 people by name, but there are also other groups like the crowd or many women that we just heard in the reading of the Scripture. Matthew 27, verses 3 through 5, kind of gives us a follow-up from the previous chapter about Judas. It says, Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and the elder, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Then he, Judas, threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. This is a significant verse right here. I'm not going to preach Judas into heaven or Judas into hell. 
But the fact is, we might be surprised who's in heaven because this is statements of repentance. It says he was remorseful. He brought back the pieces of silver that he'd received, which is a complete act of repentance. You say, yeah, but he hanged himself. I love what one of my mentors, Dr. Kenneth Hagin, said, because we often ask the question about suicide. Do people who commit suicide go to hell? If you call me on the phone, you ask me that question, I'm going to say, you absolutely will go to hell. Because I don't want you to kill yourself. (laughs) But see, I'm not the judge of the heart. He said, we don't condemn people who are sick in their body and die of cancer. They're sick in their mind. That's a sickness. So I think it really has to do with the context. And we have zero evidence of knowing exactly what's in a person's heart. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. So as I say, you might be surprised who's in heaven among the righteous. The Roman trial assures death by crucifixion. Following the night of Jesus' agonizing prayer of surrender to the Father's will is followed by Jesus' arrest, mock trial. Remember Jesus' prayer? Not my will, but thine be done. And he prayed that three times. He said, Lord, if there's any other way, no, what you want is important. Because the cross, he knew what was ahead. Jesus was quite a student of Scripture. You say, well, he was the Son of God, he knew everything. Well, no, actually, he limited himself to a human body and a human brain. And he came into the context of where we live. It says he grew in knowledge and in wisdom. So, he's God in a human body and confined. You, do you feel the confines of a human body? Jesus had the same. But he cried, not my will, but thine be done. That's important because chapter 27 picks up from that. Then morning came and the chief priests and elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. I've got a statement here that's very critical for you to capture. Gethsemane always leads to the cross. When you pray, God, I'm going to do your will, not mine. Something is going to die. He said, that's not very nice. No, listen to this verse right here. Paul said it so clearly. Indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. My ego is no longer central. Did you you see that? Your ego is no longer central. It is no longer important that I appear righteous before you or have your good opinion. And I am no longer driven to impress God. Christ lives in me. And the life you see me living is not mine. Not my will but thine be done. Remember the prayer? But it is lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Christianity is an exchanged life. We have someone who exchanged his life for us to live, but we give our life to him. Not my will be done. My Gethsemane leads me to die. But Romans 6 tells us that we are baptized into his death, that we might be raised into his life. And this is what Paul is declaring there in Galatians chapter 2. The story of Jesus' painful encounters with pain-filled people 
is recounted in the four Gospels with literally multitude, thousands of people. Jesus met thousands and thousands and thousands of pain-filled people. We have crowds of up to 5,000 men, not including women and children. They had the 2.5 kids we have in America. Uh, that will be a substantial group, over 20,000 people. And of course, they came to be healed. They needed healing. But they stayed so long for as long sermon as they got hungry. And Jesus multiplied food to give to them. Those pain-filled people are listed right here in this text. I put them in a list, and you've just read the text. So you'll see that all of these people are here. Pilate, which gets a large section, verses 11 to 26. Pilate is the governor, and he is the quintessential politician. He wants to please everybody, but especially the Roman government, because that's who put him in power. The context of this conflict has been brewing for several years. You might remember in the Old Testament that the children of Israel were carried into Babylon, today, modern-day Baghdad, Iraq, to serve Nebuchadnezzar. And it was prophesied by Jeremiah that they would be there, but they would only be there 70 years. The 69th year, Daniel, is, and he declares it in his book, the 69th year, I fasted and I prayed. He knew that it was coming close, that they were going to be delivered from that land. And so they went back, and they went back in shifts, one group, next group, next group. But the first thing they wanted to do was to rebuild the temple and rebuild the walls because Nebuchadnezzar had ravaged it. The, the, the troops had destroyed the temple, so they went back. And this was the temple that Solomon built. Of course, if you read the text of Solomon's temple, there was a lot of gold. They ripped off the gold, took it to Iraq, Babylon. So they came back to build their temple because a place of worship is a house of worship. We got to rebuild this. But they still, although they went back, when they were going back, there are all kind of legal letters that were sent to other kings. We better watch out for these Israelites. There are a rebellious people. Now, God said that about them too, by the way. <laughs> he said, you're stiff-necked and rebellious. But they said they're the rebellious people, and what they're going to do is get in there, have their own nation, and then they are going to quit paying taxes. It's all about the money. So that's how they made all the kings around them hate them. They saw them as a problem. But they came back, rebuilt the walls, rebuilt the temple, and quite phenomenal, actually, King Artaxerxes helped pay for it because his wine taster, by the name of Nehemiah, anybody heard of Nehemiah? He's the shortest man in the Bible. He's only knee high. And so, Nehemiah. Uh, and he was the taster, the wine taster for the king. And he said, I have a heart to go back and rebuild my city. And by the way, we need some funding. He was the biggest fundraiser for this project. And after they got the city rebuilt, they voted him to be the governor. <laughs> so he, uh, quite a, a beautiful story. But this conflict, always people trying to take Jerusalem, even in the intertestamental period, people trying to destroy the Israelites. And I love it the way Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 says, in the fullness of time, Jesus came born of a virgin. 
because this fullness of time, there were tensions against this country. Herod, often called Herod the Great, which we see in the New Testament, and who also ordered for the, the, the oh, what did we just have here? Uh, the census. <laughs> they ordered the census, and that's why Mary and Joseph had to go down to Bethlehem. But that's not the only reason he had to go to Bethlehem. God had prophesied he'd be born in Bethlehem. <laughs> and so Herod the Great was in charge, and he, he was a great builder. So he started adding, even while Jesus was a child, he is building on and adding on to the temple. He's making one of the most beautiful places, and that's where we found at the beginning of chapter 26 that the disciples took Jesus down to Jerusalem like he had never seen it before and said, look at all this beautiful stuff. Isn't this amazing? They were wowed by the beauty of what was happening there. But there was a thing brewing. Remember Herod ordered when he heard there was a king born in Bethlehem. He ordered all the Jewish babies two years and under to be killed. That's the tension that was going on. They still thought the Jews were going to rise up. Then, of course, now Jesus, who is a Jewish leader and quite popular all across the land. Matter of fact, when the chief priest first started plotting, he said, we, we, we got to be careful. The people really think he's cool. And so Pilate is now the Roman leader the chief priest is the spiritual leader. And he has condemned in his court with false witnesses this person should be crucified. So now Pilate has to make a judgment. As governor, he has to be the judge of what happens in his region. And so he says, he talked to Jesus. He came out and he said, you know what? This guy isn't, isn't guilty. They said, yes, he is. Yes, he is. John records a little more of the story, and he said, it says Pilate went back in and said, are you king of the Jews? He said, you say. Then he started asking him other questions. Jesus wouldn't say anything. He said, don't you know I have the power to kill you? He said, no man has the power to kill me. Because I give my life. Jesus went through what he went through. But see, what empowered him to? Gethsemane. If you'll precede all your battles with I don't want my way, I want his way, then you can endure the battle. <laughs> if you'll go ahead and settle that will issue. Not my will, but yours be done. Then, of course, you can handle the conflict because you know that if battles come against you, not that he sent them, but that he's going to see you through them. Or he's going to fulfill his will throughout the process. I can say that with confidence. Pilate doesn't want to kill Jesus, but he also, I told you, was a people-pleasing politician. And he doesn't want a Jewish insurrection under his watch. So he orders Jesus to be beaten. Told them to crucify them, but they said, we can't because under Roman law, we can't crucify. They had to have the approval of the governor. He gave it. Jesus was beaten and crucified. Of course, we see Barabbas here. And by the way, his first name is Jesus. Many texts say Jesus Barabbas. So, what an incredible paradox here. Two Jesuses up here. And which one are you going to take? He's called a notorious sinner. 
he had been involved in earlier days of insurrection, trying to get a little army behind the scenes to take back Jerusalem from the Romans. <laughs> and so he was arrested for treason. He wasn't just a robber and a thief. He was also arrested for treason, which meant his crucifixion was already assured. What a contrast. Pilate's temple soldiers, I, I put in brackets, bad cops, because they tortured Jesus. They slapped him. They poked a stick in his eye. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They were also ordered by Pilate, by the way, to beat him with stripes. With a cat of nine tails, bones and leather to rip skin. Then they put a robe on that bleeding back. Then they took the robe off of that bleeding back. I don't know how many of you put band-aids on a big cut. But when you pull it off, it starts bleeding again. But Jesus had 39 stripes on his back. Then there's the Roman soldiers at the cross who actually carried out the crucifixion. And they were also at the tomb. Now, isn't that amazing that you would have to guard a place where somebody's buried. He said he's going to be raised in three days. We, we better put some guards out there. Because his disciples could come stealing. Later they told that story. They said, well, the disciples came and stole Jesus. But of course they can't account for the 500 witnesses that saw him alive. And... Uh, Paul recounts that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Of course, also, the pain-filled people who caused Jesus pain were the crowds. They're yelling, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said, but he's innocent. I can't do that. That's where he came up with the idea, because at Passover weekend, you could actually release a prisoner. Who would you have me release? Jesus or Jesus? Barabbas. They said, Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. We want that insurrectionist, that robber, that thief. We don't want Jesus. And of course, why would the chief priest rile the crowd up to say that? Because they're afraid they're going to lose their positions. They're a little bit weaselly in their politics, too. Because we already read, by trickery, they carried out the trial of Jesus. Rushed it through their court. The chief priests, tribes, leaders of the people, all the way throughout the whole story, are against Jesus. And through two thieves on the cross. Now, I list these names and as under pain-filled people who cause Jesus pain. You see, they are individuals who also had problems. They had pain in their life. Pilate, political struggle to please everybody. We call it the please disease here. Maybe you have it. Or oh, Barabbas, somebody who has just been, lived a life that is so disreputable. I'm going to call a member's name here because he's very open with his testimonies. He's standing out there, Mark McGowan. He's, he, he is now leading the Coachella Valley Rescue Mission outside outreaches, men's ministry. Mark, wave your hand right there, bro. What an incredible. He said, I've been in the lowest of low prisons. But guess what? He 
he had pain. He had pain in his life. The drug addiction was rooted in pain. Addictions are connected to self-medication. This pain is so deep, I've got to medicate myself. I, I can't handle the real life. I've got to create a pretend life. Go to another place. Pilate's temple soldiers, when you harass people, you've got a conscious problem. We talk about, and they're doing all kinds of sociological studies about the prison and the difference between sociopaths and psychopaths. And they actually have a blood test now, but they won't allow it to be done in the prisons because then people will be identified as psychopaths. <laughs> But often those who have just done what we think unspeakable things to other human beings are psychopathic. And consequently, there's some pain inside of them that they're trying to get out. We don't know their history. We don't know what they went through. We don't know what torment they've gone through in their lifetime that got inside of them. And, and listen, I'm not a psychologist, but I study psychology. I'm a, I'm a, a biblical man, and I, I don't change over to psychological views and erase the Bible. The Bible is all about what psychologists say is the root of pain. Guilt or hurt. And the Bible addresses those that doesn't it? So we don't know what would allow a person to take a stick and put it in another person's eye. To stick thorns, and we're not talking about your little baby things in the in the in the blueberry in the blackberry patch. I'll tell you why I used to go in the blackberry patches because my mother and my grandmother required me to go in there, but of course I got blackberry cobbler out of it <laughs> but in the middle of June and early July when they become ripe you have to put on full clothes <laughs> long sleeves or it will rip you apart they're just little bitty things Jesus is thorns stuck in a crown of thorns stuck in his scalp they pulled his beard they spat in his face. You almost have to be a psychopath to do that. In other words, you have no compassion, no empathy for another human being. The crowds we know were broken, sick, hungry, poor, and controlled by both their religion and by the government. And all we know about the two thieves is that they're robbers or thieves. That's all we know. Of course, some people say it was the Apostle Paul's dad. My old man was crucified with Christ. So <laughs> you guys are going to have to liven up a little bit here. These are profound statements made in the middle of serious talk. But there are also pain-filled people who love Jesus. And they came to relieve his pain. Pilate's wife, by the way, interceded for him. She sent a message to her husband and said, have nothing to do, and listen to this, with this just man. Did you read a moment ago when you were reading through the text? It says that Pilate called him a just person. He got that from his wife. She said, I've suffered many things and dreams because of him. See, God was trying to reach her. And she tried to step in to stop the crucifixion. Then there's Simon of Cyrene. He's actually from Libya, which is where Cyrene is. So here we have an African man treated like a slave. You 
carry his cross. Because Jesus was so worn out from all the beatings, all the bleeding. Many Alice would say that losing that kind of blood would be very difficult to walk up a hill, much less carry a heavy cross. So Cyrene steps beside him to help him. Do you know that he and his descendants are part of the early church? Alexander, who sadly got diverted with heresy and Paul called him by name, but also Rufus. Now, Rufus, uh, actually his mother, when Paul wrote the book of Romans in chapter 6, he said, and say hello to Rufus and my mother and his mother. Rufus's mother was in Rome church, and so was Rufus. So these were believers and influenced, of course, by a godly father. Mary Magdalene, long story about her, right? And she came as a sinner to Jesus. And she lived quite a questionable life. We don't have a detail of all of her sins, but she was very sorrowful over how she had lived. But here she is, watching his crucifixion, and there to support him. And by the way, she is also at his resurrection, and the first one to see him alive. And maybe you don't believe in women preacher, but she was the first to declare the gospel of resurrection. Because she was told by the angels, go tell Peter and John, what you've seen. And he, of course, showed up to the disciples after his resurrection. And then 500 witnesses watched him ascend. So Mary was quite significant. Now, if you watch the History Channel, she was Jesus' wife. And she gave him two sons. I almost cussed right there. I almost cussed. I stopped myself from cussing. I'll use Alabama. That's a dang lie. It's not true. It isn't true. It's a fabrication. And I've read the gospel according to Mary Magdalene. And they found a gospel in a cave in France. And supposedly, that's where she fled after the persecution of the church. And the parchments that they found were disheveled. There were little pieces. So if you read the book, and I'm okay with you reading it, as long as you don't think you're reading the gospel. It's called Apophrica, other books. But the editor would put in a snippet of what she said and then add what this means is. Well, what we think is, this is probably when, and they've got all these little connecting paragraphs to try to put all these pieces together to say what Mary was thinking. And it is a complete fabric. I just want to give you that side issue about what we're talking about Mary Magdalene. Then, of course, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. Some translations, Joseph, J-O-S-E-S. Then the son, the mother of Zebedee's sons, and we know them by name, don't we? James and John, who traveled with Peter, James, and John. Then it adds many women who followed Jesus from Galilee ministered to him. Listen to that commitment. These women journeyed about 200 miles. Either by donkey or foot, there was no rail line. There was no buses. There were no cars. 
But they came to Jerusalem to be with Jesus. And at the risk of being labeled a follower of someone who's being killed for high treason. The risk of association. And they came. But you know, I've read the stories of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I encourage you to read through this whole story of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because each had a different view and some various stories. Some had the same stories. But through that, I know that Jesus touched out to hurting people. And there are several women that the stories are told specifically about their encounter with Jesus, their pain, their sinful lives, their family, one who had her son die. And she was alone. And Jesus raised her son from the dead. He saw their pain. He saw their hurt. But now, see, now, here's your Bible knowledge. I've given you a list, two lists, by the way. It's in the app if you had. But I've given you a list of 14, seven and seven. Seven against, seven four. But who's left out here? Mary, the mother of Jesus. She was there. Do you think Mary had pain? What would it be like to see your son beaten, bleeding, shamed, and crucified, which they didn't take you down alive? You stayed there till you died. And she had to watch him die of suffocation. That'd be painful, wouldn't it? Mary had pain. And it's so beautiful that in John's gospel, he looks at his mother and points at John and says, Mom, that's your son. And he looked at John and he said, John, that's your mother. Jesus, before he died, made sure mom was taken care of. <laughs> and I want to be sure she's going to be okay. You saw the text a moment ago that was read, and Jesus cried out with a loud voice. Eli and Elias, in, in the text she read, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But did you notice that it said, and he cried out again? Did he cry out the same thing? And why would he say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I know why. Because, see, I have the rest of the New Testament in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, He who knew no sin. See, Pilate said he doesn't have any sin. He's sinless. He's been tried by the Roman government. And they said he's not, he don't have any sin. But he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. But what did Jesus say that second time? Luke tells us, Jesus cried out again, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And he died. What kind of trust does it take to go to a cross? and die knowing your father's going to take care of you. Abraham in the book of Genesis 
but then recounted in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, says it by faith. Abraham offered Isaac, knowing that if necessary, God would raise him from the dead. God told you to take your child and go to a mountain and take the wood and offer a burnt sacrifice. Say, say, now I'm going to be Latino. No way, Jose. Ain't going to happen. But what trust it would take. I'm willing to obey you if I die. When Jesus said, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass for me. He was talking about the cup of dying. On a cross in shame and separation from the Father was the biggest concern of his heart. My God is going to have to forsake me when I become sin. And now Jesus, Father. I've listed some of the challenges and I just want to go through these lists and I skipped the order of the slides. But it's all about the message, not about the slides, by the way. But listen to this. This is the problems that people had. The reason I'm listing these problems is because one of them might hit where you are, might touch your pain or your problem, because these are all the people that are going through this passion of death with Christ. Deceit, self-seeking, jealous, hate-filled, cold-hearted. Dead with religion, deceived and deceptive. Religious pleas, disease, or notorious sinner. But guess what? If you were one of those who loved him and identified with those who loved him with pain, guess what? They were also notorious sinners. Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Not one person at the foot of the cross was righteous on their own. They were oppressed. Maybe you have. You've been minimized. Rejected. You're fearful, sick, hungry, blind, maimed, and naked. Some had huge demands imposed to them by the religious and political climate of their culture. How much did it take for Joseph of Arimathea to step up to say, you know what, I'm going to give my brand new tomb to him. I just went to the funeral home. I made all the arrangements. I prepaid for everything. They have cut out a huge hole in the rock got a nice stone cover for it and I'm going to give it to Jesus. The man who just got crucified for insurrection and blasphemy against God. He had political pressure. Nicodemus, by the way. Do you know Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea came from the same city? And Nicodemus came at midnight because he was a Pharisee and he was taking a risk to go talk to Jesus. But it was to him that Jesus taught him, you must be born again. So these questions that are asked here, I want to close with these questions because I, I think you need to answer these questions for you. Pilate said, what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? That will be the most important question you will ever answer. Because we know the 
answer to the next question, why have you forsaken me? Well, Jesus was forsaken, forsaken so that you wouldn't have to be. What are you going to do with Jesus who is called Christ? And then, of course, in the story at the close, Jesus is called the Son of God. Listen to this text. When the centurion and those who were with me were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. You know he was crucified for saying it was? And the centurion, that's someone who oversees a hundred soldiers, and those that were with him, said, yeah, that was the Son of God because it got dark all over the earth and an earthquake came. But not just that. The tombs, graves opened and Old Testament saints were raised from the dead and walked around the city in Jerusalem and people saw them. He said, man, there's only the Son of God could do that. His death raised others to life. Now, now, wouldn't that make a great movie? People coming out of their graves. Then, of course, how'd they get back in? And what would it be like to walk around the city and say, well, listen, this is a nasty place called earth. I'm going back to heaven. Go back, lay down in the grave. Because they didn't keep walking around and they didn't teach and preach. They did tell about the resurrection. And so, this was supernatural times. This wasn't magic. It was supernatural times. And yet, Jesus dies in the midst of this. We'll have to cover this next week in the resurrection. But we'll end this service with what are you going to do with Jesus Christ? What are you going to do with him? Because the wrong answer doesn't yield a good future. I just say that clearly to you. Those who believe in Jesus have hope of an eternal life. Those who do not believe in Jesus have eternal punishment. It's as simple as that. And only by being deceived or spiritual blindness could you choose the wrong one. I say spiritual blindness because Paul said the God of this world. And maybe you think the Heavenly Father is God of this world, but actually God delegated authority to the earth and man delegated it to Satan by bowing his knee and obeying him. And you've bowed your knee to Satan by following his intentions for your life. But see, there's two different homes you're going to go to. And one's pretty nasty. The other one's wonderful. And God wants you to be with him. That's what this whole story is about. The whole Bible's about. I don't know how many of you just love these movies where the dad has a child stolen and maybe it's Mel Gibson and he goes out around the planet to find that daughter and he kills everybody in the process because it's a search and rescue mission. The story of the Bible is a search and rescue mission. Adam fell and God's family was stolen. We talk about what you lost in the fall, but what did God lose? His children now are too ashamed to come to him. They're, they're hiding from him. They're running from him. He wants his family back. But he had a different strategy. Rather than taking a machine gun and just shooting us all, he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to put my son on that earth, and I'm going to kill him. Isaiah saw this 700 years before it happened. 
And he said he was a man who was rejected by God. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace, shalom, peace and prosperity was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. I'm going to put in a substitute. Instead of punishing you, I'm going to punish him, and he's going to be me. I'm going to come in a human body and take your punishment. You know, it all originated by a statement by Adam. He said, it's your fault, God. You gave me this woman. Your fault. He didn't really blame the woman. He blamed God for giving him the woman. But the love story of the Bible is that God says, although he's not guilty, it's impossible for God to sin. He's not guilty. But he said, I'll tell you what, I'll take the punishment. I'll take the punishment. Adam, there's going to be a seed of woman. Eve, there's going to be a seed of woman that is going to come and crush the head of the serpent. And it will bruise his heel. That's the cross. The victory was at the cross. So I want to pray for you right now, and I tell you how simple it is. Two kinds of prayer. One prayer for salvation. That if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And he went on to say, just in case you didn't hear him, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not to say that he picks on to be saved, not to be saved. Whosoever. You're a whosoever. If you'll call on him, he'll save you. The second prayer, of course, is if you've got this pain in your life, Jesus died for you and that pain. He didn't just die to save you and take you to heaven one day. He died so that you could be healed and well and restored because he took the punishment of what brought this evil to the earth. And we can be set free through Jesus. Let's pray together. I'll tell you what, we're going to do a little differently. I want to ask our prayer partners to please come down here. And, and I, I want you to be touched by somebody who's praying for you. And so they'll put their hand on your shoulder uh, or on your head. Or if you're comfortable, they might join hands with you. But to pray and to pray for the needs and as they're preparing, and I want some more prayer partners down here because I believe that we're going to see. And you're going to see the Lord do some things in your life. But I want you to all stand up. You're changing your posture, but don't change your spiritual posture because God is speaking to your heart right now. Salvation is not difficult. And I want you to go to heaven with God's children. Pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord, I call on you. I confess that Jesus is my Lord. I don't deserve salvation, but I don't come on my own merits. I come in faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you for saving me and giving me a new beginning. It's a new beginning for you because anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. Something changes inside of you. And as they're praying for you, Pastor Daniel, could you come and lead that song that you wrote about Jesus saving Jesus, save me.